with Hanchan tonight, and then I'm going to share with you the latter part of class um, some of the photos uh, that I took um, on this recent trip to Taiwan and talk about them a little bit. And also, a caution to everybody it's cold, it's wet, and so dress up. Uh, when you come to the hall, grab the blankets in the back and use them to cover your legs if you need to cover your shoulders. Um, preferably don't cover your head when you're doing sitting meditation, um, but a good scarf will keep your neck warm and keep the chill off. Um, I mentioned before, when you actually advance in the practice of um, this kind of dhyana meditation, you develop both vertical and horizontal breathing. The horizontal breathing is actually allows you to breathe without using much vertical up and down, inhaling through the nose. That's why after a while, the vertical breathing becomes very quiet and still. Uh, to some point, it's almost as if it's not happening, but that's because you're breathing horizontally. You're exchanging through the pores. So as a result, uh, if the weather is cold, if there's a draft, you're more susceptible. So the thing to do is to wear the appropriate clothes when it's cold and uh, a scarf around the neck will keep that chill off that, that spot. Top of your head uh, won't get cold if you're doing it right. It'll actually be warm. Um, also, don't sit on concrete, uh, bare concrete, or uh, you think maybe you're going to go out into Tilden tonight and really macho it up and sit in the rain. <laughs> until you get awakened. Uh, chances are you'll get the flu and you won't get awakened. Uh, so avoid that kind of extreme. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to look like the Michelin man, uh, you know, the fat puffed up with all kinds of uh, winter gear on so you look like you're going to Nanuka the North or something. So modest, but keep the vital parts of your body covered. Um, and my teacher also advised staying off, even if you're on a non-concrete floor, if the chill is coming up through the floor, uh, put some mat down to insulate it. You don't want that going into your legs and your hips. Uh, this, is, this is for those of you who would like to be practicing while you're 60 or 70 like me and don't want to burn out when you're 30. Um, so any questions on that? Just the physical part of sitting with the weather changes? Of course, the opposite is true when it gets really warm, then you want to, yes. You see, she's not covering her head, she's covering half her neck. So if you sit in half lotus, you cover half your head. If you sit in full lotus, you cover your whole head. If you sit cross leg, no. Um, generally, you'll find uh, also if you don't cover your head like that, your energy will flow better and you won't get as sleepy. Uh, now, when you're done sitting, you can put the hat back on like you did. So I don't know if you had it off or on while you were sitting, but if you develop the practice of not covering your head uh, while you're sitting, uh, you'll find through your own experimentation, this is pretty good. It's beneficial. A little louder. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So you thought the patriarchs did, it's okay for you, okay. Uh, yeah, generally, though, if you look at almost all of the images, you'll see uh, meditators with their heads uncovered. You might see someone like Xu Yun with his head covered, but usually he's not in meditation at that point. It's a picture taken um, after they're in meditation. But even, you know, if you're really cold, cold, cold climate where there's a lot of wind and draft, then, you know, you just adjust accordingly. I'm just giving you general guidelines. Don't see them as hard and fixed. And basically, it's just things that make it a little more easy to meditate. Uh, meditation really is about subduing and opening the mind and not necessarily your head. <laughs> so, yeah, stay focused on that. Anyhow, so let's get into this part of the text tonight. Um, how was the movie last week or the week before? Last week was Thanksgiving, so, right? So you had a movie. 
Nobody saw it. <laughs> How was the movie, Locke, since you ran it? <laughs> you didn't watch it either. <laughs> it was good? Oh. Well, somebody, I don't know who told me after they saw the movie, they wanted to go be a hermit in the mountains, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody who was really inspired is off in the mountains as hermits. Okay, good enough. Um, so Hanchan here is uh, going into uh, a passage just to bring people up. He's talking about in doing the practice, there's different ways uh, to come at this, and he describes a more direct way and a more gradual way. Uh, and then the gradual way is what he's talking about here tonight. Um, he's saying even if someone is really vigorous and they do have sharp faculties and they really practice hard, it's easy to remove superficial hindrances, and we talked about this before. These are um, manifest negative emotions um, that most of us have and, and would consider to be a good person, something we want to reduce or eliminate. Uh, these appear more on the surface. They're recognizable, both by ourselves and others, although sometimes uh, not so clearly by ourselves, but with a little uh, friendly pointing it out from a teacher or from a really good friend, we spot it immediately and want to change them, and they, re they respond fairly well to a conscious intent or to intentionality. Uh, now, on the other hand, he says there are deeper hindrances. These are more difficult to dispel, and he calls these like a sickness. Um, my teacher used to refer to these as uh, one's mobbing. Uh, I don't know if I have the terms or what's, it, what's the uh, uh, tone. The second? Okay, so it's two and four. Two and four. Everybody know two and four? It goes Mao Bing. And Mao Bing, he would use to describe deep, uh, almost latent or um, non manifest bad habits, faults, tendencies, unwholesome tendencies uh, that we're not really conscious of, but really are driving a lot of what we do. Uh, it's, it's the inner mechanisms uh, that then really define our personality and our character traits. And these are important because basically you might say, well, what does this have to do with being awakened? But if you understand that the, the awakening or the awakened being comes from the human being, so the Buddha nature comes from human nature, then the transformation of that character trait that make up our personality is the very stuff of awakening. This is where Buddhism bodhisattvas come from, from transforming their persons. It is not some mystical light that shines down or a revelation that comes from outside um, or some magical, mystical thing that happens when they stop their minds. But rather, it's a transformation and a perfection of their humanity that is the the fruition of which is awakening and virtue and all those wholesome qualities of kindness and compassion. They're hard won in the sense because they come from the getting rid of what stands in the way of that anger, jealousy, greed, and so forth. So these particular ones he's talking about, and he's going to talk about, are the ones that are deeper and hard to get rid of. Now it takes us into that's this passage that I want to work on tonight. So again, uh, note that the slashes are uh, tentative uh, translations of this, and the whole thing is tentative. But he says, first, um, in terms of, the, of a basic sickness, of a basic character trait that one might bring that is unwholesome, do not thirst for esoteric wonders or special states. Um, because the original mind, the, the fundamental mind, is true and solid or real, depending on how you want to work with the language, very ordinary, not far out, uh, and we use this as not far out, meaning uh, in the colloquial sense of like way out there, um, but also not far outside of your own nature. So you can see far out being used both ways. 
In other words, when the text says, do not seek outside, seek within your own being, that you can use not far away in this sense. Uh, Confucius uses it in his teachings when he says, um, Shoshan Weiban, the self-cultivation is the root of everything else. Therefore, the superior person or the cultivated person, the exemplary person, does a process of looking closer and closer to home until the process takes it into an inner reflection on one's behavior, one's conduct, one's thoughts in the most minute ways. This is called investigating things in, in their almost uh, micro. And from there, it says, from that deep investigation to the core of your being uh, that Confucius says takes place in a most solitary way that nobody sees. It's when you're alone with yourself that you do this work. When that is corrected, when that's rectified, then it starts to come out and manifest in your person and your behavior, and then it manifests in your relationship and your family, and then it manifests from there into the larger society, and that's the way you go about changing the world. So he says if you want to begin this process of great change, you have to begin in the smallest of these places. So this is what this not seeking outside has to do with, but seeking within. And it doesn't mean seeking within is sort of like, let your mind just drop into some inner well and see what happens. You know, that's, sometimes people think, I'm seeking within, you know, and where are you? I'm just in these internal reveries. Um, it's not like that. Actually, the seeking within is an investigative process. It's self-reflective, and it's somewhat self-critical in that you're going in and, and really cleaning up, cleaning house, so to speak. Okay, so... That is why the ancient saying, he says, the awakened ones are as if not awakened. They are just the same, we, we left this colloquial, the same old guy, even though they have changed their ways. Um, we're still tracing out, do we find the source of that yet? The ancient saying? Because lots of times ancient sayings are not uh, very easy to reference. Because the ancients didn't necessarily uh, assign their names to text nor do they footnote or references as we do now. So ancient sayings often get handed down um, by word of mouth, and then they're written, and they're adjusted over time, and nobody claims credit. Uh, hence, all the ancients are poor because they never got um, you know, copyright, which means they didn't get royalties for their writing. So Lao Tzu, as far as we know, was not a millionaire, uh, nor is Confucius. Um, the Buddha gave it all away, even though he acquired a lot. Uh, seems to be a pattern. <laughs> so same with their writings. In fact, the reason they do this is not some form of self-effacement or humility. It's that they truly believe they do not own this, that this wisdom is universal, and they just kind of uh, aw awakened to it and became aware of it. And so they pass it on, not as a personal proprietary, my knowledge or my insight, but something that's always thus, and therefore, they're just saying it again in different ways. Um, and even if we look at it in the contemporary sense, although the language and the expressions of this may differ, and they have to for modern contemporary audiences, uh, the basic thrust of them doesn't change over all this time. Uh, and so part of the process we're engaged in uh, is trying to reanimate. Um, OK, my tones again. One goo. Is that close? One goo. One goo. One goo. Now we go first, second. Shishini. One goo, um, which is also used for heating up leftovers. <laughs> so, but this means to reanimate and bring it back to life in the contemporary idiom, in the contemporary culture. And yet, although we're doing that, the teaching remains the same. So he says, the awakened ones are as if not awakened. They're just the same old person, even though they have changed their ways. Still, there is nothing spectacular about it. What are we to make of this? Um, the, the awakened ones, the, the sages, um, are as if not awakened. What does that mean? What does that mean? If you look further, the same old, even though they changed, it's still the same. How do you explain that? What does that mean? They show it. Okay, they don't show it, which would mean they actually don't make a show of it. 
So even though they have this date, they don't advertise and show it, but it could mean you don't see it. So there's, there's two ways of looking at this. They don't show it and parade about their accomplishment somehow, but it could also mean you don't see it. So if this is true, what has changed is they see things profoundly differently. Remember in the platform sutra of the sixth patriarch says when he was encountering the fifth patriarch and he had his awakening state, then they asked, um, what did you discuss? What was transmitted? Where was the magic or the wonder? He said, well, we just talked about jian, seeing. And so there didn't appear, and in fact, nobody knew that he had the state until he was gone. So even though that happens, there's no mark to it, no xiang. Now, in other words, you see differently, but you're not necessarily seen differently. You see differently, very differently. But maybe nobody would recognize that you're doing that. You're not seen seen differently by others. So it has two meanings here, and it's, it's a really important one because, again, it's pointing to the ordinariness of this experience. That when this happens, although you feel a profound transformation and your life changes 180 degrees from everything almost that you've been doing previously. Let me finish and then, although that happens, there's not necessarily a mark to it. There's not necessarily, except your behavior changes. Your relationships may change. Your career might change. But it, it is not something where all of a sudden you're walking around bathed in light and there's music and sweet aroma coming off of you. Okay? Now, your question. Okay, so what's, what's the, let's be specific here. This is the joy of doing text. Does Mencius talk about awakening here? What is the line? Dao de, Dao de, what's Dao de? Are you asking her? <laughs> is, uh, there's a new form of talking in English, which is if you want to say something, you, uh, you say it, I really believe this. And it's like, you do? Yes? <laughs> There's a constant sort of, uh, con how would you say, it? Uh, conditioned. So you're saying it's virtue. He's, talking. He's not talking about awakening. He's talking about a, a development of your human character uh, that, has, that does have an appearance to it. If you're uh, living uh, cleanly, uh, you're eating the right foods, you're hanging out with the right people, you're not abusing your body, uh, and you're cultivating a certain kind of character, which is virtue, that does have an appearance. So virtue can, huh? But these guys are doing that. They won't but that's not what's being talked about here. What's being talked about here is the inner awakening, the opening of the mind to the things as they really are. That is different. Awakening and virtue are connected. Virtue becomes the basis, you hope, and it's true. Virtue is the basis for the ground for awakening. Virtue is shila. It's, it's the precepting, if you want to look at it in that Buddhist sense. It's the clearing of your ethical and behavioral uh, norms. So you're, li you're a good person. And a good people look good. I don't mean they look good like uh, Brad Pitt or somebody or whoever is the who's the most beautiful woman now I don't know Gwyneth Paltrow or something right <laughs> my mother said I was but that's <laughs> um, it's not that kind of appearance but there is a quality that you see in a good person um, 
that shows whether it's a Mother Teresa or someone like, say, Nelson Mandela, who just passed away. Um, think of other people that have these qualities, and it comes from virtue. But awakening is what's being talked about here, and that itself is Wu Xiang. It's markless. It doesn't have an appearance. So we make that distinction. Huh? A little louder. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But they didn't know what he, and what, what was he showing, what was he manifesting, they didn't know either. So, you know, we look at this, and maybe at that point the Buddha manifested something. Because we know, if you, if you look at the text, when this happens, the texts say this. At the same time, it says one who has this can now begin to manifest in certain forms with certain conditions to appear in certain ways to inspire people and such and such. So it's almost like an ability to then turn on something or turn off something. Sometimes this is called uh, hua shan, transformation body. And so you read a text and it says, the Buddha sat in meditation, entered a, a like a lion sprint samadhi, and then began to manifest signs and whatnot before speaking. Okay, but this is a, a consciously controlled expedient device that someone who has a stake can do, but it's not the same as what Han Chan's talking about here tonight. And in fact, somebody who has done this would purposely not want to manifest anything because they just like to continue in their ordinary way and do what they do without being noticed. And so this meow means um, wondrous, wonderful. Uh, it can mean very subtle and nuanced and, and fine, but it can also mean somewhat extraordinary. It has all these different meanings to it. So in, you're right, in the context is what he's talking about is to seek for this is to mis, be misguided fundamentally in what you're doing, but also in the awakening state, this is not what happens. It's, it's not what manifests. And so there isn't any spectacular thing going on here externally. Well, louder. Louder in case some of you are interested. Lights, halos, clouds. Multiple arms. Walking in the air. Beams of light coming out of your hair pores, shining and filling up the 10,000 realms. <laughs> Jets of water, jets of, yeah, see, everybody knows this. It's a little scary that we all know this, but how do you get awakened? I don't know, but I know what happens when you're there. All of this comes, and then people make offerings to you and bow, and it's really wonderful. <laughs> okay, uh, so he's just, he's just pointing out, don't go down this road. This, this particular thing is the hardest, one of the hardest thirst to get a handle on for people who cultivate and, and begin spiritual practice the thirst for some awakened spiritual state, some wondrous thing, some mark of your accomplishment, is so deeply rooted that it's very hard to recognize. And that's why the text comes back again and again and again. Don't seek for anything. Everything you have is whole and complete. Even bringing forth a resolve for Bodhi is not a wish to get something, but a commitment to get things out of the way that stop it. So your resolve for Bodhi is really about removing all the impediments to your enlightenment. If you see your resolve to Bodhi in that way, rather than, okay, I made it, now when do I get it? It actually impedes the actual process of the awakening. So again, people say, well, what about the desire or thirst for Bodhi? That's actually a mistranslation. It's an aspiration. And the very meaning of it means you aspire to get rid of all the afflictions and all the coverings that keep you from that natural state. 
So your aspiration is to come clean, is to straighten out, is to rectify yourself. It's not to get something. Does that help? Okay. Um, so let's pause here. In the time we have left, um, I'm not going to show you anything that will inspire you to go off to the mountains, but uh, what I wanted to show you tonight, we just got back from a, about a 10-day trip uh, to Taiwan. Uh, we went to a number of way places, a number of Buddhist centers, uh, universities, uh, talking with all kinds of very interesting people at sometimes very high levels about what we're doing, about what they're doing, and sharing notes. And for me, this trip was unexpectedly fine. And normally I hate to travel, I usually get sick. Uh, and so I pack my suitcase with all kinds of medicines and whatnot and just prepare to be miserable. And, um, and that's what I sought for and it didn't come. I didn't get it. <laughs> None of that happened. Um, in fact, it was a pleasant surprise at many levels. So tonight I just wanted to share with you uh, some of the photos that I took. Um, and I'm just going to cover this week a couple of the themes that came out that really inspired me. First of all, the weather was tolerable better than tonight here in Berkeley. So that was good. The food was exquisite. So next week I'll have pictures of the food. Uh, if you want to eat vegetarian food or turn somebody on to vegetarian food, go to Taiwan. Man, I've never, uh, I've never, <laughs> thus I've eaten, I've never eaten better than that. Um, but the surprising thing that I want to share with you tonight is uh, an artistic renaissance that's going on that we were partial and got to see and, and get involved in. We had a very interesting conversation with this colony of artists that are sort of at the vanguard of this. Um, also, the thing that really struck me uh, was the relational, uh, the, the sort of um, normal relationships between people that really uh, impressed me. Uh, and partly I want to do this tonight also to, sh to bring up the idea, uh, there's Rusher Wu Wan, thus I have heard. But there's also a concept, Rusher Wu Jin, thus I have seen. In other words, Buddhist art in itself can be a mechanism to uh, stir the aspiration for awakening and for Bodhi if it's done well. And what I'm interested in, and I have been for a long time, uh, I worked with this partly with my, my thesis, was as Buddhism had gone from culture to culture, it has it has taken on translations through the language of that culture. And the art forms have then transformed through that culture. So some other time I'll show you a slideshow I put together how Burmese Buddhas don't look like Thai Buddhas, that don't look like Japanese Buddhas, that don't look like Korean, and so on and so forth. Each culture has imprinted on the image of a Buddha its unique sort of cultural, uh, ethnic, physiognomy characteristics. Well, I've been really interested in when's that going to happen in the West? You know, and where, when, when does in this process do we get statuary and images that someone who is basically from a Western background says, wow, that, that really inspires, that moves me because that looks like something I might myself turn into imagine be as opposed to an Indian or a Chinese. And now this provoked a great discussion, I won't say debate, but discussion on the trip because people who were coming from an Asian background saw some of these images as cute, as artistic, but not as authentic. And because they meant what they had been growing up in their childhood scene, that was the authentic Buddha. Other people on our trip said, this is the first time I've been moved by an image or a statue that brought up something inside of me. And they wouldn't they didn't have the same response. So we have to ask the question, what is art for in Buddhism? What is it all about? And we won't, we won't saturate that tonight, but it's an interesting question. What is the nature of Buddhist art? First of all, we know it's symbolic. Just everybody understand that. In other words, when you see Guan Yin, this isn't the picture of Guan Yin. Or you see Shakyamuni Buddha. That's not how Shakyamuni Buddha looked. That's, that's a symbolic representation. Okay, everybody, no, because there weren't any pictures or anything like that. So the representation of the symbolic state of awakening is what artists are trying to convey. Moreover, they're trying to also, uh, as Moliere says, the purpose of art is both to instruct and to inspire, uh, to cause both to happen. So if it's done well, 
the imagery and the statues should bring up sentiments and feelings and emotions, if you will, that are positive, pure, and longing for awakening, compassion, and kindness. Okay, that being said, let's look at some of these. I'm going to have to turn so I can see them. And I don't know how they turn out on the screen. I just worked on these today. Uh, I'm very primitive in my use of things in terms of I'm working with iPhoto, and I use about five different tools, and I'm stretched. Okay, so let's just start looking at some of these. Um, this colony that we found is in a place called Yinga, outside of Taipei, um, about 10, 15 minutes from Taipei, Dashui, the university. Uh, some, it, some people call it Pottery Town, which, you know, <laughs> if you go by that, you'd never go there. It, it's sort of like a uh, corn village in Nebraska or, you know, <laughs> but it's not pottery. Pottery is only one of the things they're doing there. The man who owns this place, has invited a number of artists from around Taiwan to come. He supports them, and he gives them uh, all they need to survive, and says, basically, I want you to just do what you do, and do, do it true, and that's it. He doesn't, it's not necessarily for commercial. So they're generating these, and his philosophy, their philosophy, which we don't have time to go tonight because I video recorded a talk we had with them, was basically, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they're trying to tap into the deepest aspects of Chinese culture, art, motifs, and at the same time, bring them into some kind of fusion with a modern and even modern Western. So there's this kind of um, interface that they're bringing to bear, and when, when we had our conversation, it was like, well, we're doing the same thing with Buddhism. And we started explaining what we were doing, and then there was this real affinity and resonance at that point. Uh, between, between us. We were doing philosophic and spiritually what they were doing artistically and aesthetically. And th that the two would match up was very interesting. Uh, next week I'll show you pictures of them and our exchange with them. We went back with uh, the nuns and everything uh, and it was quite, quite fantastic. So the first floor is the stuff they make, the second floor is where they make and the other stuff that they make. But the third floor, which nobody really goes to, is its private collection, which a lot of this is taken from that isn't for sale yet and most people never see. So here's, here's the first one. I don't know how that shows on the screen. Uh, that is Bodhidharma. Um, just, just get the images, we'll go next one. And we're hopping all over. Uh, this one I really wanted and I couldn't have. <laughs> now, this is ancient or modern, what do you think? It looks modern, but it's actually Song Dynasty, right? And it's behind a glass case. And I've been looking for one of these for a long time. And because it was in a glass case, I didn't even ask what the price was, and it wasn't for sale. But look at the, the, the face and the expression there. This is made of wood. Next one. OK, this one I found particularly moving, and I, I almost missed it. And, Christine was with us, and she found this one. She said, you got to come and see. I said, oh, I'm taking, no, no, you got to come and see. You gotta. Finally, I went and saw this, and this is a mo modern or ancient? Very modern. Uh, this is Guanyin Bodhisattva, and you're trying to say, well, is it Indian, Central Asia? Is it modern West? I don't know. You can go to the next. I should have a few in a row like this. This is what they're doing with uh, kind of Pure Land backgrounds. Okay, so it's like this is to evoke, evoke the sense when the Pure Land is, there's flowers and, and so forth and whatnot. And so the sense of green, of purity, it, it's a little Monet, Matisse, whatnot. Keep going. That's a darker one or the same one. Yeah, another. Oh, slow, 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 slow down. You're going too fast. <laughs> <laughs> this is literally, uh, what is it? Uh, Zoma Kang Hua. We're really riding the horse looking at the flowers. Again, these go hand in hand. So you see the lotus, the bottom right, but then the other flowers. And so these are flowers that could come from anywhere. But the, the feeling you have here is a bathing in, an, in a kind of purity, an immersion in flowers, what, what flowers and incense symbolize in Buddhism. So go to the next. Now they're starting to add this to, they're having the ancient form of the vase, but they're adding it. And what's interesting about this, I have videos of them doing this, and they're actually working with the Maubi on this. 
This is all layered. They do one, let it dry, do another, let it dry, do another, let it dry. They're doing three, four, five, six, seven different layers, and then it's baked all at once. <laughs> and they, you cannot tell what it's gonna look like until you bake it. So when these colors go on, they don't look like this at all. But they're working with this. Uh, there's uh, the group went, uh, three of the monks. Uh, that's the president of Taibei Dashwe. He came. Uh, he's, I'd go back. He's caught up in a pamphlet there that is from the tour we did in 1977 or 78. Um, now, I won't show you the pictures on there, but on there is myself, Hung Shur, and Doug Powers and others. And the, the president is really amused because of the transformation that's taken place. <laughs> But this is the third floor upstairs studio of this artist. Keep going. Uh, some of the nuns that came. And that nun, uh, go back, that nun was taking some of the pictures. She really was captivated by it. Okay, next one. That's the artist who did the Guan Yin. So he just came in from a studio. He was invited in uh, to talk a little with us. Keep going. Yeah. Very nice, interesting man. Uh, so there he's the conversation, he's got his laptop computer, he's talking about that's uh, Mr. Chun, who was sort of our master of everything, getting us through this, and had been going there for 10 years uh, on his own, just to look at this stuff and be inspired, and then took us back that day. So this is a gathering, go on, next one. Uh, these are the artists. <laughs> and of course, that guy now is looking at <laughs> the same thing, he's going, oh my God, that's the same guys? So, you know, if you see them, you wouldn't think they were extraordinary, but then you start looking at their artwork and it's quite impressive. So Hung Shur is explaining something to them that that's who we were back in 77, 78, uh, and they're quite amused. Uh, and then each one of them spoke the philosophy of their art, which is very, actually very eloquent. Keep going. Right, same. And there he is next to the picture. The picture doesn't do justice to it. Um, You'd have to see it up close, but this one is a very moving image of Guanyin Bodhisattva uh, that I, and I said to him, man, I mean, how many months did it take you to do that? He said, actually, I did it in a day. I said, really? He said, well, actually, two hours. And he said, you want one? <laughs> want me to do one for you? <laughs> yeah, next. Okay, so there you have some of the work that's being done now with, again, modern, right? But look at the dynamic quality of this statue. Your guess is that's who? Could be Abhitabha or Shakyamuni, but probably Amitabha. But look at the flow and the dynamism there. Next. Now this is actually a plate. So now they're doing uh, plate and platter work uh, with this, next, this one is also on a big plate, so the plate's about as big as a laptop computer. This is actually a lot of modern, so-called modern technology in this kind of picture because they can never burn the hot to this high temperature before, and now they, they can do it and they use a lot of metal in the colors. Mm -hmm. And you found it inspiring. <laughs> no, no, but the, the general, the trip. Right, right, of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is something that it's innovation that they come up with that they didn't have in the past. What's more, when, uh, when I was talking to uh, Michael Nyland and, and Henry Rosemont and Roger Ames, they, they put out a new translation of the, the, the classic of filial reverence or so forth, the, uh, uh, what is it, the Xiaojing. Yeah. They were all talking, they wanted to get an image for the cover, but they didn't want one of those ancient stiff things. And I'm gonna send this to them because I think it's perfect. There's the family, you know, and if you talk about a, a sort of filial relational harmony, it's wonderful. By the way, that's my next theme was, I saw still manifest in Taiwan, this in real relationships. And I took some pictures of this, but I couldn't take them all. But actually the human relationships still mirror this kind of idea, um, and that was most impressive to me, especially for the children with the parents and the grandparents. Go again, next one. Both ancient and modern. Next.
Ja. Go. Mm-hmm. And just, ro this is all in temper control room that uh, the work that they're doing just piled up. Uh, hold on. Uh, so there's been uh, curators from Germany and France who have come over and tried to just scoop this stuff up and he's not selling it. Uh, this is one that's very interesting. There's going to be a series of four. So this is one side. Doug himself really liked this one. So he had me take these pictures. Um, but you see it's an ancient vase shape, but look at the designs now, a little Picasso-esque too. So first side, next one. Second, we're turning it. Third, <laughs> look at that. I mean, it's like, and the fourth, complete turn. And that's, that's about as this big. Yeah. Yeah, it's a vase. Well, see the hand. Yeah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> okay, next one. Again, vase work, layer upon layer of this. Another. Another. Now, see, we'll go back. It's like there you have the script on there, which is more traditional, but then look at the, the, the patterns and the color combination. Next. Another yet. The deep uh, blue is almost lapis lazuli. Again. Are these all specifically still in They're drawing on ancient, modern, east and west. Um, but within it, they say that the ancient spirit is in sense spiritual as well. So they're, now here you have, this is, this is actually a painting. It's actually about that size. So he's got row, you pull them out. And we just pulled this one out. The, the white flash is there. That's the sign of awakening. That's what happens when you get awakened, the, the white light. No, <laughs> sorry, those are the neon lights on top. I couldn't get them out because it's, it's a painting. So I couldn't get it out. And I don't know how to do that thing with photography yet, so you take it out. But that's about how big it is. And it's just awesome because you look at the face of the sage, it's not east or west. And that's, you know, it's the monk and the attendant and doing a fire for key. But just to talk to that point a little bit. Go ahead. What they say these followers, well, their job was to kind of, uh, to kind of transfer the culture in a kind of way they, they see themselves as, as carriers of culture. So they, they act as, they're kind of formed into people. They say, I, we have been inspired by our ancestors. So it's our job every day was to really just ask ourselves, what can we do? Oh, no. You got to go into the mic and say that? Here. No, say it into the mic. I just, um, I was just saying, basically, I mean, what he, actually, he repeated this several times. He said that he's, he's not about looking to the past and figuring out what his, our ancestors left us, um, but He's mainly interested in in figuring out what he can do for the next for the future people. So he's actually making new art. That that, that that's what they at least what they strive to do is make new art. Of course, you know there's no new art from nobody is uh, clean slate. So so whatever today's culture is, they're they're they are they are in, you know breathing breathing in a culture and then manifesting that in the art in a very innovative way. Yeah, and also you see, this is, uh, again, human relation, teacher, student in relation. The student's making the tea to serve together, and the teacher is preserving through the text the teachings. Go on again. I mean, there's so much here. There's a better shot of it, I think. Uh, yeah, isn't that wonderful? Well, again, and then there's a big ecological movement going on in Taiwan, so they're trying to represent that, too, as a, the preservation of natural beauty and wonder. Next. Isn't that, yeah, just awesome. But again, the, the many dimensions, instead of having a, a one-dimensional 
image, you have depth. Again, that's a painting. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't indicate. So you're left to figure it out or not. But the, the, the right hand side looks like a guanyin, yes. Yeah. But the right but the left hand side may not be may not be a guanyin. And that's actually the three three of the Yeah. The artist of art. Next. <laughs> Bodhidharma. No, no, no. Oh sorry. Okay. <laughs> they they they're using a lot of uh, pastels uh, rather than yeah. Keep going. You just get a feel. This is a painting. I mean, it's just incredible the power of water. Another. It's on a vase. Huh? <laughs> Next, I don't know what he's looking at. Painting. This one I had to bring out a little more. This is actually a statue. Um, just buried in an, one of his back spaces that I captured. Next. This is actually a, 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 you know, a, a freeze. A so it's a plate on bull, bass relief, so it's coming out. Uh, and this, this sort of thing you would just hang on your wall, but it, it's both flat and three-dimensional. Next. This one is just a stunning, uh, uh, this is a picture, painting. Uh, now, uh, yeah, okay, so pause. Now we switch gears, and this is where I was getting into the social. So what struck me about Taiwan is it's sort of 1950s America in a sense, although the tech is high and the artist renaissance is going on. When you actually get to seeing people, there's still real community and real relationships going on. Uh, I saw constantly children with their parents or grandparents out in public, and none of them were doing this. I did not see this a lot at all. I saw people looking face to face, talking and interrelating, inner, what we call inner subjectivity, very pronounced in contrast to here. So this is the jade and flower market that um, s someone took me to in the morning, and of course, out for sale. This is just an open market of two blocks long in the central part of Taipei. So instead of removing this, and putting up condos and high-rises, they built around, uh, so the modern is going up right in the midst of preserving this. And here's, of course, what they're doing is selling their wares, but there's a whole conversational thing going on here about what's happening, who's sick, who's well. Some of these people have been doing this for 35 years. Uh, and so, and they just engage you into their conversation. Where are you from? What are you doing? Blah, 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 and they just pull you in. So I just got a couple. It was harder to do this um, because I, I'm a big, Western guy with a camera, and it's like, you know, I'm not unobtrusive. <laughs> so I had to be quick in some of this and coming out, but I wanted to convey the sense of community. Um, in other words, they're not having blue ribbon, pa blue ribbon panels to how can we build community. Community is already there, they're just maintaining it. Next, just another feel for the activity. Keep going. Uh, I and in the midst of this, that's going on, you know, these two guys are huddled down and they're playing, I don't know what that is. Well, I wouldn't know, Chinese chess, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and he's looking at me sort of like, are you giving cues to him? <laughs> but they were just playing there in between the stalls. And again, it's just a natural gathering center. Next. And this guy was really uh, flamboyant and really wanted to sell me something. And so I just turned, but he's, he's a character. And 
just wonderfully uh, open. And I, here I show you again, every child that I saw was in some relationship with an adult. And you see both. You see the hand of, uh, that's probably mother or older sister, and then you see somebody else's hand guiding her to something or, but just the embrace, the idea, the idea of <laughs> don't spit on the beads. <laughs> yeah. Next. And then the artistry, I, I'm, this man was working uh, with uh, silver and pewter and whatnot carving, and he's just doing his work right there next to his stall. And when I, I paused, I said, can I take a picture? I said, sure, where are you from, blah, 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 and he just kept going. Next. Uh, and again, these are people, if you show interest in them, this is how they respond. So I said, oh, in my broken Chinese, what a cute dog. And she ran, came right up and said, you should get one if you like it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was just, just engaging, you know. The dog was less interested in me, but <laughs> there it was. No problem. Next. This is part of the flower gardening. You buy fresh flowers every day. Next. Another. <laughs> another one saying hello. And yeah. Really? Have dogs instead of kids. I'm not convinced that it's even easier, but that's okay. Next. And this, I, this is a, I had so many I couldn't take, but this just tells you this, this relational thing is just so strong. And I saw many children relating to their parents in this way. One, the restaurant we were at, the boy was sitting there watching his mother and dad back and forth, watching their faces as they had a conversation. And then a dish came and the father wasn't convinced he would like it, and now the little kid, remembering how he was fed when he was a kid that something he didn't like, delighted in taking the scoop down and putting it up to his dad. Come on, dad, you gotta try this. In other words, the kid didn't have any device, he didn't have any PlayStation. He was into the intersubjectivity, and this is the basis of how humanity transfers the deeper values generation to generation. Uh, it's blurred because it's hard to capture. Go next. Again, uh, we were just sitting in a restaurant, and yet it doesn't capture, but you notice there's a couple kids, there's a whole family, you don't see grandma down at the end, and they're all talking. Now, contrast, this last one, I was in L.A., both kids were there with the parents and the grandma. The kids had screens on the table, each their own screen, watching their own video thing. Not only not down in their lap, now they had screens about this size that were right on the table. Same when I was back in the East Coast and the Midwest. Um, and I really... I can't emphasize this enough that when this is lost, social problems become immense. When you start losing this interconnectivity. Next. Uh, and here's the modern going up right in the midst of these neighborhoods. This is, I think, 101, right? It's the big financial center. Financial, financial center. Next. That's it. Okay. So uh, next week, um, I'll process some more and we'll go into some more uh, so you can see uh, both images, some of the people, and also in the food. And I'm taking pictures of some of the food so it'll salivate your vegetarian wants. <laughs> okay, enough for tonight. Uh, any other questions, follow up on this? I hope you enjoyed, uh, I did. So we'll do the transference uh, in English. There too. The song. The song. Happy birthday. Oh no 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 no. We'll do transference. We're not gonna do happy birthday. <laughs> well, it's an announcement. There's the Amitabha session coming up pretty soon. It's in December 15th to for two weeks, but we'll have an event for the first week. So December 15th to the 21st, I believe. So if people are interested, you're welcome to sign up for that. Oh, hear and see our hands and hearts.
find in giving unity. May their minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light break the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise.